Welcome back to Lean AppSec. We're getting ready to get into our third session of the day. Uh, this might be the one that I'm most excited about, where we're going to talk through building an AppSec program or code governance program uh, for a company that uh, we came up with. But before we get into that, uh, thank you so much, Darren and Amit, for joining me uh, and going with uh, this idea. Uh, Darren, can you kick us off by just introducing yourself, talking a little bit about your experience? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm the lead solution architect for Endor Labs. Um, I joined after being at CrowdStrike for about a year and a half and running an AppSec program there. I was a security researcher and practitioner for, I was coming up on 15 years now before that. So I, I've seen a lot of different organizations try to build AppSec programs, try different things, tried a few of them myself. Um, so the AppSec's been, you know, kind of a, the center of my practice for quite a while. I'm very excited to bring that to this conversation. So yeah, I'm Amit. I am the head of security here at Rocket Lawyer, and um, my background has been through and through security for over 15 years, but kind of all over the place. So I started more on the offensive side, doing a lot of uh, pen testing, uh, infrastructure applications, and such. And then I moved more on the defense side. So the last few years have been. Uh, building defensive solutions as well as you know managing teams to build out information security programs. Amazing. And what we're doing today is uh, talking about how to actually build an application security program from the ground up. What are some of the questions that you need to ask when you're approaching something like this? Um, we reached out to a lot of people. We got some feedback on what's going to be interesting to see and actually talk about. And a lot of the panel discussions are great, uh, but also tend to be a little high level, which is important. But at some point, you want to get into the nitty gritty of how do you actually get things done? What questions do you need to ask? So what we did is we came up with a mock company. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Whisker Wellness. Uh, Whisker Wellness is a pet lifestyle company. It empowers pet owners with comprehensive software to track and enhance their pet's uh, lifestyle and nutrition. And uh, they're a company of about 700 employees. They have uh, just under 300 developers, between 250 and 300 developers, and a very small existing application security team. Uh, this is a consumer software product that is being sold on a monthly subscription. We'll go a little bit over their tech stack as well. Um, but they have approached two expert advisors to help them answer some questions on how an AppSec program uh, should look like. So, Darren, let me uh, just kick it back to you. Where do we even start? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the great first question, right? So, you know, we, we have a very small AppSec team with a very big application development team right, in comparison, right? The, the ratio is like one to 150, roughly. Um, and that they got to handle leadership and reporting and program building and execution and all these things. So. I think our first question really is, you know, where where's our first point of, of insert? Do we try to go, you know, kind of far to the right and look at monitoring what's in production? Or do we start somewhere further to the left or in the middle um, and try to get in the pipeline or something like that? Um, I mean, you've, you've built, you've scratch built some things before. Like, where, where would you start with these folks? Yeah, so, uh, you know, you don't say 150 to 1, right? <laughs> but so typical for organizations of small size, right? And uh, it's always a challenge um, to deal with uh, big uh, engineering organizations and having small security teams. Um, I think the key to answer your question, Darren, really lies in understanding the business. So... Um, you know, depending on what kind of business you have, the answer differs a lot. But in this specific case, we are talking about a consumer product company. They're probably selling products online. They're perhaps taking credit card data and such online. Um, you know, you have like a whole suite of products um, you're hopefully releasing um, through either your monolith or um, through your CICD pipeline, through microservices, um, that sort of architecture. But um, to start off, you need to understand where the risk lies for such an organization, where can be the biggest um, damage or risk to the organization. And from that point onwards, you kind of start drilling down what are the key areas. So, um, you know, within the uh, layer cake of application security, you start with like everything facing on the internet. 
um, all the way down to how are you writing your code, releasing your code, uh, all the way to you know to education and the training of the developers and such. Um, what I would say from my experience is that um, typically organizations around this size, um, the maturity level is pretty low. And so you really want to focus your energies on things which would provide most bang for the buck. So as soon as you have done like this sort of like high level risk assessment and understand where could be the most uh, risk um, for the organization, then you start drilling down into um, you know, starting with some dynamic testing, uh, doing a lot of pen tests, trying to bring in automation tools around um, checking the, you know, the security of the code you are releasing, ensuring that your um, front line is really secure. So your typical VAF solutions and, you know, protecting your APIs and such come into play. Um, so that's kind of, where I would start diving into first. Um, and we can, of course, talk about like each one of these areas or domains specifically. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, in fact, like as, as we start to kind of plan that out, let me just kind of uh, throw open a, a... So, you know, that you, you talked a lot about kind of starting on the right, right? So we have things like uh, dynamic testing, right? Getting kind of getting that visibility um, into like, what's happening in production, right? Like, cause you can't know what you need to fix about the program until you know what's happening in the real world, right? We're not starting from, there's no product. So, you know, these things are kind of like, kind of a begin on the right kind of strategy. Um, and I think, I think we're like, a lot of people kind of rush this a little bit, right? And they go like, I just want to buy, buy a tool, plug it in, it'll tell me where all my risks are. But there's that whole like prepping for the next phase while you build the one you're in. So like if, if we're starting on the right, we got to think about like, okay, what's, what do we do after that? Like we get the visibility, what are we going to do with all that visibility? Right. Because otherwise I'm going to end up with a, a big report and I go to my, my CIO or my CTO and I go, you know, Hey, I, you know, I've, I've, I have all these problems and they're like, great. We were better off when we didn't know. Right. So how do you, how do you move from like doing something like, uh, you know, doing some DAS, maybe some SAS as a gateway right before production? And moving that into something like, how are you going to act on those? Like, how do you build a program to support something like that? Yeah, yeah. So I think one thing which can help a lot is to do fundamental, like, um, you know, the um, the analysis of um, all the testing. Uh, which has been done up till now, right? So just kind of going through your Jira tickets and looking historically for past several quarters, um, what are the major, uh, you know, issues, security issues which have been discovered over time, right? And what, how were they discovered? Was it through some bug bounty programs or somebody externally reporting them or, you know, maybe perhaps pen tests were performed or somebody internally tested it or your customers were telling you about it? Um, you have this whole gamut of how you have intaken uh, these security problems, um, and, you know, typically at this stage, you have security generalists who are dealing with this. Once you come in as a specialist, you start uh, diving deeper into uh, how these um, different issues were discovered. Um, and based on that, you can start figuring out where do you want to spend most of your energies, right? So take, for example, if, um, you know, a lot of your security incidents are coming from um, out of date software being used and, um, you know, things um, just um, going down because of out of date software, right? Now, really, you want to start looking into solutions which are uh, looking at your entire um, code base and be able to tell you what kind of like old libraries you're using or perhaps, you know, old applications, closed source applications you're using. Um, that's one direction, right? If 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 you are finding through your Jira tickets that, oh, a lot of my issues are around uh, bots and bots attacking your site, then you want to start thinking about, okay, what kind of um, frontline defenses I need? What are these bots trying to do? Are they trying to create fake accounts or are they trying to 
um, you know, uh, test credit cards and such. So now if majority of your incidents are lying there, then, you know, you start investing into tooling around there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, given this this sort of um, uh, fictitious company we are thinking, I think both of these are like a very relevant for an organization uh, which is going to sell uh, pet products. Yeah, I, I like that you brought up what is essentially mm -hmm. like basic threat modeling, right? Because like so many people wait to do threat modeling until they have a program, they try to like shove it in later on. Mm -hmm. But like what you're talking about of doing discovery of like what issues do we already know about so that when we discover new ones, we have some kind of threat model and general like security strategy to fit them into, right? Um, and, and I think I think the strategy is a worthy conversation because it, it's very easy, I think, for us as practitioners to get into like, we know we kind of have an idea of what controls need to be in place at a high level. Like, I, and I know I need SCA over here. I know I need SAST over here. I know I need DAST here. I know I need pen tests, right? Um, mm -hmm. But there's that whole thing of like, you know, when I when I first started working in security, it was all about like keep the edge secure, right? And like the inside is this lovely juicy center, and you've got the security egg, right? As long as you don't pierce my shell, we're fine. But like we've moved on as an industry, like we, we can't use that model anymore. We can't use the stop all bad things from happening. So we have to start balancing things like you know, rather than worry about like mean time between failure is the only measure of success, right? Like how often do bad things happen? Like we also have to get out of like once we know about the bad thing, how quickly can we get it to repair? And I think the threat model is is you know a high level threat model, especially like what are the organization's priorities? What are our existential threats? Is a consumer company? Do we have to worry about PCI compliance? Did we outsource that? Right? Um, those kinds yeah. of things. Like, are we going to be publicly traded in the near future? Should we try to be SOX compliant now? Right? Mm -hmm. Should we build that from the from the ground up? That kind of stuff. Right. Um, th those kinds of considerations, like what are the existential threats and then what are the like malicious and accident threats? And that's all great until you get to like, okay, then what are we going to do about them? Like, how are we going to fix them rapidly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, uh, I would reframe that a little differently than earlier we, you know, there is the saying in security community, right? Like there are two kinds of organizations, ones who know who are hacked and the ones who don't, right? And so really like the age we are moved into is like we have a lot of visibility now, uh, a lot of things were kind of glanced over uh, before, but now um, you, you, you have that visibility with a lot of like logging, monitoring, or just awareness around security more, uh, security awareness in engineering organizations among software developers uh, as well. So, um, you know, the, uh, you, uh, yeah, you, you know, you bring uh, in all of this uh, data, you start, you, like you described, you know, you have this like laundry list of tools you're going to put in, but what is the most critical for the business? Where do you want to spend the money to get the most bang for the buck? Um, you know, oh, you're going public, then your um, um, the the investments you're gonna make are gonna be much different than say, for example, you're just like dealing with bot attacks every single day. Then um, you know uh, you want to put in the energy somewhere else, the investment somewhere else, um, and mo most of the times, organizations this size are really largely in operation mode. They're just dealing with a lot of day-to-day -day, uh, incidents, and you know almost I would say like seventy to eighty percent of the time is being spent in operational activities. But what you really want to do is like move further and further left where you're spending, um, you know, almost 50% of your time doing strategic work and this 60, 70% of the operational work um, goes down. Um, because if you're just fighting fires all the time, then you really are not paying attention to where the business risks are, where, where the puck is going. Uh, I don't play hockey, but, you know, just using that analogy, um, you know, you got to follow uh, where the puck is going. And that's that's really key uh, once you are in, in uh, you know, this, this sort of role, this sort of setup. I want to jump in here uh, real quick uh, and ask a question from the perspective of the, the company. Uh, so as someone who is not an application security expert and is working on budgeting for something like this, um, one of the key things that I'm looking at is how many people am I going to have to hire? I already have, let's say, 
two application security engineers uh, who are overworked and uh, have a ratio of about 100 developers between them and uh, and the application security engineers. Um, we we also have this security team um, reporting into the CTO's organization from a general thought of helping alignment between uh, security and engineering. But uh, so far, uh, it's just like you said, our engineers have been drowning in operational day to day stuff. So we haven't really got to, to that point. So what do you uh, what do you two think from a staffing perspective? Do I need to go out and hire more people? Is there some organization that I need to put in place? Or do I first invest in some sort of process to to help make these uh, the this small team of two actually productive? Yeah, I, I, like I, I, I hate to give this answer, but the answer I think really is both, right? Uh, because uh, there's never enough headcount, right? And like, I think that you'll get very similar responses from the software development team, right? 250 is probably not enough for what this company is trying to do, especially in the economy the way it is today, right? Like headcount's hard to come by. It's hard to find the people who are skilled. Um, AppSec as a specialty is not something that's, you know, got a, got a deep bench. Uh, we're just starting to see degree programs and things like that. So most of our AppSec folks are coming from a development background or from some other security specialty. Right. So they're, they're kind of stumbling into it a little bit. So mature, experienced apps like people who can kind of hit the ground running are, are really difficult and expensive to find. And if you just hire a bunch of people and you don't have a good process or a good plan for how you're going to solve a problem with them, one, I mean, good luck getting the money for to do it. And, and two, like you're going to have a bunch of very skilled people who are really unhappy, right? Because they don't know what to do. They can't make an impact. They can't make a difference. So I, I really think like you got to lead with like process and program design. And it's, it's the uncomfortable thing of like choosing to accept risk for a while so you can get your ducks in a row, right? Yeah, yeah, I 100% I agree with that. And I think it, it's um, both these areas, you have to kind of, you know, invest in both directions. Um, you can't just throw people at all your problems and, you know, scaling is extremely difficult especially in information security um just people wise um having skill sets is a big challenge as well and um you know i i mean we are not there yet but maybe ai would like make make all of our uh, jobs much easier um and you you would you could do you know more things with less people but um, yeah, you, you 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 need a lot of this automation in place, a lot of this scaling in place, even at um, this stage, or, or at least you gotta start building a strategy around it and start thinking about like, what are the key tools you wanna invest in so that you can leverage the people. Um, and it goes goes hand in hand, right? The, the people have to match the skill sets, they have to be specialized, uh, even within application security, there is so much niche. Uh, you will find people specializing in data security, or you know, backend, or um, you know, dealing with fraud, uh, more like trust engineering sort of work, right? So it's really critical to um, yeah match both of these. Again, goes back to knowing what's the goal for the business, um, what are their major risks, and making sure. Uh, you're investing in in the right areas okay, to achieve so, those goals. Yeah. So I'm um I'm building out a hiring plan. Um, I know that I can't go too far too far beyond you know the the very few people on my appsec team. I might uh, have uh, some other people on the broader um, security team who are uh, working as well. But uh, what do you think in terms of uh, reporting structure? Where should they sit? Uh, should this be aligned with uh, an engineering organization? Uh, should this be a part of like a separate security organization, but all rolls up to, to the CTO? And I also can tell you that um, our CTO uh, is more of an engineer, right? So needs to be informed when it comes to, uh, to security practices. So what do you think about the reporting structure for this team? Yeah, I mean, there's always trades, right? <laughs> um, I, I've seen the, the kind of three alignments I've seen that 
they all work pretty well, but they all have like different things. And so I think you have to align to organizational culture and priorities too, right? So if you're reporting up to a CTO, uh, you, there's a lot of advantages there, right? Your, your, your partnerships and your relationships with engineering, which are a super important part of the program, especially when you have like not enough staff, right? Um, is, is a little easier to get when you report to the same C level. Um, but like you can also end up reporting through like a, a risk organization, which, you know, uh, reports to the CFO. And that gives you some separation and that like you can, you can advance security goals independent of engineering goals sometimes. And that has advantages, but also it creates kind of a natural competition for resources with, with engineering, right? You're, you're not on the same team. You have C levels with different alignment and those kinds of things. I've even seen places do line it up to like a chief product officer. So that's like security is a feature of the product. If this were like a security org, like a security, com security company, that would be really, really nice. I think for a consumer company, that would be extremely odd, right? Because there's going to be a natural tension of like, but features are always going to win over security when security isn't like a core goal of the company. So, I mean, I, I think I'm happy here that we're reporting up to CTO, but like, what have you seen with that kind of stuff on that? Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, 100% right. I think uh, the three major um, verticals I've seen security teams report to, either it's the CTO, the technical org, or the, in some cases, CFO, uh, but ge that's generally, you know, uh, later down, like more mature organizations or more bigger organizations, and then the product officer. Um, you know, if you were like a blockchain company and security is like, or, or you know, a trading company or something and security is like very key for your product to exist, then perhaps it makes sense to sit under the product org. But um, mo for most organizations, um, it would make sense for them to be uh, under the CTO. Um, and especially at this stage of the organization, um, like you said, you know, pros and cons with the reporting structure for each one of them. There is so much more technical alignment and, um, you know, just uh, being able to tightly work with engineers, uh, be able to sit on their sprints, understand what the features they are planning, uh, how can you insert uh, security early on in the stage. Um, so that becomes much easier when you're reporting uh, to a CTO. The, of course, the flip side is that you know if the um, if the CTO or the teams are like really focused on just shipping features, then you're always competing against um, time and money uh, as a security team trying to reduce the risk. Um, yeah, and from a you know if you if you're reporting more on the CFO side, um, you would have very strong uh, financial analysis and like just uh, you know it's it's the risk um, measurements they do on that sort of side of the house is very similar to what you would do for cybersecurity. So you 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 get advantages of um, bringing in that kind of thinking of like how you're spending the money and how you're reducing that risk. Um, but on the flip side, like I said, you know you're you're more decoupled with the technical orgs, and so it's harder to drive change faster. Yeah. A couple of things you said, like brought up a couple of things, like one of the things you talk about, like in terms of scaling up and, and being able to have those relationships with development is like using whatever influence you have from a security standpoint to like have that mix of you, you need those application security, like specific people with that specific expertise. But I've also seen some success in some orgs of like building a security champions program where you use your influence to increase the size of the engineering team a little bit and influence their hiring path to say like, hey, every product team needs to have a couple of people who have some experience with application security topics, even though they're developers, and they can really be kind of a force multiplier for the application security experts. They don't need to be experts themselves. They just need to know enough to like handle the basics and empower them for decision making for their team for, for a lot of the security decisions. Have you ever seen something like that work? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. I have tried it myself and kind of learned it the hard way on how to make it succeed versus how it can be uh, actually uh, quite a bit of struggle. Um, you know, the security champions is a great way to kind of drumbeat security within the organization, um, bring uh, more people under the fold, get them excited about security, help them understand security. Um, especially on the engineering side, it uh, really helps a lot to build those relationships with the engineers um, so that, you know, 
they don't think of you as like another pesky security guy who's going to come and bug me and take away like half of my work week trying to be, you know solve some little security problem right so um in those aspects it really helps uh, to have security champions the key thing i would say though is that you really have to sustain and uh, to sustain you need to think out what are you going to do with the security program so it's not uh, enough to just like you know create a group of security champions and kind of just like talk to them on slack every now and then right you really want to define what are the success metrics for having such a um, security body or a security champion group and how can you make sure these goals are being attained um, right without that it just becomes another slack channel another ton of you know meeting in your calendar to uh, take care of um and the owner should really still fall on the security team that's one key thing i would mention um it, it's very important for the security teams to drive uh, the conversations the trainings um the education you know different programs um awards for bugs stuff like that like that all needs to be driven and taken ownership from the security teams um and then you can have a successful security champions program that's that's the second time you've mentioned like measures and metrics um and i think that's really important right that, that's, that's one of the hardest things to to accomplish i think right because like in a perfect world we'd be able to measure the risk and then we did the thing and then the risk went down but like measuring risk is impossible for most orgs. So how do you, like, as someone who spent a good chunk of your career reporting up to, you know, CISOs and CTOs and like that, like what, how do you start, like, especially with a small program like this, that we're starting from green field, like how do you start showing that the things that we're spending all this money and time on are actually improving the org security posture? Yeah, so uh, that that's a really tough one, but it's the most critical one, right? Without, having that insight into where you're spending the money, or how are you reducing the risk, where is the risk? Um, it, it's really hard to convince uh, executive teams about um, you know, what, what work are you doing and how is it valuable to the organization, right? And so um, like one of the first things I do when I've uh, come in in an organization is that I would um, set up time with a lot of the leadership uh, across the board, understand their key pain points and uh, especially around security and fraud and um, start uh, thinking about some sort of dashboards to track um, you know how how these risks um, are currently manifesting within the organization, right? So um specifically like uh you, you know if you if you take a step back and think about like uh you even within information security you have infrastructure security you have it security you have application security and you want to start measuring all of these domains and start thinking about like how many security vulnerabilities you're discovering in each one of these domains and uh, what kind of tooling is bringing in these sort of um, security uh, vulnerabilities to your attention so that you can invest in the right tooling or the right, you know, uh, people. Um, and then uh, in terms of like driving action, I think nothing drives action better than showing like, hey, we have this like laundry list of critical security vulnerabilities and this is the impact it can have in an organization and we should really start prioritizing fixing them um otherwise all these things they just like sit in jira tickets all over uh in your organization and then you're just like running um running after different teams and different people to fix these issues but really you haven't provided the executives a comprehensive picture of um what are the what's like the risk entire risk landscape for the organization and which are the key ones to prioritize um a lot of times it's helpful even you know for you as a head of security to understand like oh wow you know i have been running after this specific security uh, bug uh, for a while but i should really be focusing my time and energy on this specific um, domain so that uh, because that that brings uh, that's actually more risk to the organization right um 
in terms of like just high level metrics you want to track things like um you know how many vulnerabilities you have per line of code or uh, per app or repo or per team whatever you want to dice it as um you want to tra- track um you know similar to incident response exercises like um vulnerability remediation time how long is it taking for teams to remediate their vulnerabilities what's your coverage like how much of your uh, code are you covering with uh, different security processes you have put in place um security training coverage uh, how many of your developers have gone through some sort of training um you know if you have like compliance or uh, regulatory metrics then you're going to start thinking about those metrics with like pci compliance for example here you know if you're taking card data are you descoping as much as you can so that you don't have to satisfy a lot of the Uh, pci compliance requirements um if you're running bug bounty programs you're going to start measuring bug bounty metrics so all these metrics are really important and the the more you can collect all of them in a single dashboard and have a view for yourself uh, that's the view you want to present to the executives as well i have a a question that came up uh, pretty often through uh, another session that we did on lean appsec the code governance uh, round table Uh, we had some security leaders we had some engineering leaders and there are a few themes that kept coming up that uh, we here at whisker wellness are very concerned about uh, um one was engineering regardless of where it sits in the reporting structure um tends to compete for a small budget of engineering time that's one and two is engineering uh, seems to be wasting a lot of time on security integrations on investigating vulnerabilities on um litigating basically with security team on is this really critical do i really need to focus on it even those meetings take up a good chunk of the uh, of the time makes it very very hard to justify and prioritize these things um as uh, as you said and some of the input that uh, that we got is that some security leaders are beginning to see the engineering organizations and engine and the engineering teams um basically as their customers and beginning to measure the effectiveness of security not necessarily only in risk but also in uh some sort of proxy for developer productivity so was i able to achieve application security in the way that i feel comfortable with without impeding my developers too much without making my developers uh hate me uh basically so i i want to get your your thoughts on this do you think this is a tooling uh challenge or is this a a people in process challenge uh where or or an education challenge because the the problems here how do i get my developers to not spend so much time on security inter- integrations while still achieving a reasonable level of application security that my business uh, feels uh, comfortable with and also you know it would be a bonus if my security teams and engineering teams uh were able to get along right and i didn't basically put them on on opposite uh ends of this like quote unquote you know litigation exercises um what do you think about that you know the Th- this dynamic uh, i really hate that um, there is no need to have this sort of dynamic between security teams and engineering teams um and i think this is like a very uh, old school perspective really right but if you think from an organization's perspective you're all there to make the organization succeed and you know uh, it in turn helps you succeed right and so um it really you know measuring what security teams are doing in terms of uh, developer productivity is also very critical um otherwise you're going to lose the audience and uh, again you're not achieving the real goals you are going after right and um one of the key things i have tried to institute is that instead of trying to negotiate about every single um you know one ability around say prioritization or um you know how how impact impactful it is and what not right 
it's really the security team's job to first socialize amongst these teams what are the ground rules and once you have instituted you know some wiki conference doc which talks about like hey this is how we um uh, intake vulnerabilities this is how we um you know use different metrics to understand the risk for these vulnerabilities and this is how we triage them and then send it to you you will have a much better chance of getting buy in from engineering teams than instead of trying to negotiate uh, you know priorities and time spent in like every single issue um instead you have instituted a process uh, up front and you have socialized it and you have got buy in from engineering leaders that hey this is how we should be uh, addressing or the security vulnerabilities this is how we understand these priorities and if you have issues around this or if you have input around this then we should address the process and make sure that the process includes like oh you know your your security vulnerabilities you're pushing to us they don't have cv uh, cvss scores or you know they don't have business context or whatever it is right so if uh, that that's a more fruitful conversation and then you, you you know you are on the same team you are making sure that things which are the most critical are the ones which are getting attention because the reality is that you're you're going to have you know thousands of vulnerabilities in every organization and uh, really you want to focus on the ones which can really make um, may, uh, you know reduce the risk and uh, move you further away from being an easy target yeah, I 100% agree and like I think that actually ties into this conversation about what are we measuring too, right? Because you know, developers are measured on the money they bring in. Like they're they're a profit center, right? It's shipping new features, it's the thing that sales can go out and sell. It's the thing that's going to get people to be more loyal customers and get more signups and get media attention and all these things that help the company advance and security like whether we like it or not, we're a cost center, right? So being able to track like what we cost versus the benefit that we're returning to the developers on the things they're scored against, right, is really, really key. And I think where that comes down to is we tend to get lazy in, in the security organizations a lot of times of, of going like, well, we're gonna, we're gonna call things that have a certain CVSS score critical vulns, right? When maybe they're not critical to my organization per se, mm -hmm. right? We need more context and we need to put the effort in upfront in, in tool selection, in process, in training, in you know who we hire for staff, how we train our developers, all those things, right? To make sure that when there are issues, we have enough context to go. Like, I don't care if something's a CVSS nine if it doesn't impact something that my organization actually is affected by, right? Uh, whatever that might be, right? It might be like, look, that's a, a nine in a non-regulatory environment is very different than a nine in a regulatory environment. Right. Uh, a nine where like you can't get passed by WAF to exploit it is probably more like a three. Right. Those, those environmental context things, those situational and business context things and getting those up front about like what is our our guideline for how we're going to make these assessments of what we're going to ask you to drop everything to do versus what we're going to you know get into planned work. It's the unplanned work that that ends up interrupting the, the developer team so many times. Right. Is that security comes to them and says you have to panic and freak out. We really want to limit the amount of that. We'd really much more rather get, you know, a relationship built where like, we're going to point things out, but for the most part, you'll be able to plan them in the next sprint and, and figure out accordingly how much they're costing you. And we can negotiate about when they're going to be delivered and, you know, based on the severity. And we're only going to tell you to panic and freak out when it's really, really necessary. And there's a really clear articulable risk to our business. And then everybody can kind of get on board, you know? So uh, if we're kind of zooming out a little bit, going back to, to the beginning, we talked about, okay, this company has a, a small team, uh, has made some investments in, in the field, maybe even has a, a few tools in place. So kind of recapping some of what we, we talked about, um, your first piece of advice was to start with process, right? To start thinking through the how does this process align to business goals and what uh, what this company uh, actually wants to try to do? Um, Darren, you and I had talked uh, previously about uh, trying to design a process with people and then buying tools when uh, people can no longer support that process, right? Because you're not going to be able to afford to hire all the all the people that uh, uh, that you would need. Um, so 
And, uh, and then the second piece of advice was to move away from the day-to-day -day operational activities that, uh, that we do into more of a strategy, start to think about how are we actually going to report this up, um, where we're going to place the, the team in. Um, as we're kind of approaching uh, the, the end of the session, um, what do you think are the tactical first steps uh, the actual, okay, this is day one on this job leading this uh, application security team. Where do you think I should be focusing my, uh, my efforts first? Yeah, it, it's really easy to think like I got to do everything first, right? <laughs> it, it feels <laughs> like it. Um, I, I think I kind of hit on it very at the very beginning of our conversation here, which is the, that visibility and discovery process uh, followed very quickly by how do we measure that? Right. So like figure out what we have, what are our risks? What is that organizational threat model? Right. And then kind of like, OK, now how do how do we put a measure around that so that whatever I put into place, I can find out if it's actually making progress toward my goals? Yeah, 100 percent. A lot of times you are out of choices <laughs> because you're just throwing a bunch of uh, security problems every single week and uh, it's hard to um you know uh focus on like the more strategic stuff when you're always submerged in that it's a chicken and egg kind of problem if you don't do that then you'll always be submerged in all of these security issues and so it's much better to figure out and prioritize even uh you know with like your incident pipelines and how critical these incidents are and such um, so that you you are making sure you're making progress on that 20, 30 percent of the time you have strategic today to how it can become 50 in your operational day to day stuff is becoming uh, smaller than the you know 70, 80 percent I mentioned earlier. So, um, yeah, it, um, it, it's a it's a tough job. <laughs> and uh, I guess my last question would be. What would be your advice, not to the application security people themselves, but to the people hiring them who are not necessarily security experts? So the CEO of the company, the uh, CTO of the company, the executives who need to make a decision uh, on this. What would, you, what would your advice be to them on how to make this program actually successful. For example, you talked earlier some about sometimes you need to be comfortable with accepting a little bit of risk in a while uh, for a while so you can get your ducks in a row. Um, so what would you say to them so they would have realistic expectations uh, and actually make the people that they hire happy and successful? Yeah, yeah that's a that's a really um, interesting challenge because uh, you know again security is a very niche domain. And um, people who are building startups and organizations, they, um, they, they are expert at other things. And um, even when you're like a 250, 300 people organization, a lot of times you just don't have enough of security expertise to be able to tell whether this person is gonna be the right fit for a head of security or some other person would be, right? But, <clears throat> One thing I, um, which is very true is that, um, you know, CEOs, CTOs, founders, they have a very good grasp on the business and they know where the risks to the business lie. And that's where they should lead from. Um, they might not be experts on security, but they definitely understand that they're losing money to, you know, chargebacks because of bot attacks. Or they uh, clearly understand that, oh, because of, you know, somehow dated software, uh, our systems went down, right? So they have a, and like they, they lost X number of X percentage of their revenue because of that, right? So they have a very good grasp on the financials and the business, and um, they can use that knowledge to figure out where or what kind of skill set you need from this uh, person to lead the team. Um, the assessing of the technical skill sets of the person is a, a bit of a challenge. And one interesting thing I've seen some organizations do is that they would actually outsource that part of the interview and kind of ask like 
some some you know um, fairly well known security person to assess the technical skill sets uh, of this person instead of them trying to assess that because you know they essentially have no no knowledge around that so um those would be kind of like my two two main points there yeah i definitely agree with both of those things um i think on top of that it's very important for leadership to understand that like our role as appsec leaders is a risk management role it's not necessarily about fewer vulnerabilities it's about fewer of the ones that actually pose risk to us and, and getting on that same page with them that like our job here is to figure out what the risk tolerance of the organization is and make sure that our application development practice as an organization continuously fits within that risk tolerance, right? Um, and, you know, they, we get so trapped into even leadership thinking your job is to minimize risk and it's not, right? It's to fit it to what the organization is willing to accept and, and make sure that those decisions are being accepted eyes open by the executives, right? And not just accepted because they're not understood or those cases. Um, in terms of the staffing thing, I think especially for a young AppSec organization, it's very important that the, that the boots on the ground from leadership, I mean, when, when you have a small org, leadership has got boots on the ground. They're not just doing HR management stuff, right? They, they tend to be more technical people to understand the issues. And your first core uh, application security engineers or whatever you call them in your organization, I think they need to be people that can sit down and have a conversation with development teams. And I've had really good success in having, you know, representatives, some of my senior developers, like be part of the hiring process for those core ASEs and say, like, 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 let's build that partnership. Let's have people we can respect who can like talk shop with the developers so that when they're coming and saying, I have an issue, they're coming with an, I understand what it takes to resolve this. I'm not just throwing work at you. I've made a cost benefit assessment and you can trust me and we can educate each other because we're close enough skills match wise. And I can trust them as experts on development and they can trust me as somebody who knows enough about development, but I'm an expert on security, right? And that mutual trust, I think is so important for young teams. Yeah, yep. very well said, Darren. Well, I uh, learned a whole bunch. Um, Mostly that uh, it's uh, it's not going to take me a couple of days to build the application security program for Whisker Wellness, um, but uh, I'm sure we'll build a long and enduring pet management software company. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, for everybody watching, um, we recently also did a breakdown of how um, security tooling matches with the SDLC, which I think is going to pair very well with this discussion. So the document that Darren has been building throughout this session, we will share that. We will polish it up a little bit and share that with uh, with everybody, along with some of that information about you know where uh, SCA goes in, where SAST goes in, um, a little discussion about uh, very technical, tactical things like what are reproducible builds and things like that that we will throw in there um, with the strategy level discussion that, that we had here. Uh, Amit, thank you so, so much for joining us here. I think we learned a ton from the perspective and uh, the experience that, uh, that you uh, bring to this.